Okay, so after this interesting announcement, uh, let's go back to uh, generic attacks. So uh, maybe just a quick remark before I start to, to actually answer one of the questions that was uh, asked earlier. So this is a figure from uh, one of the papers with uh, the attacks on the, the XOR combiner. And I just want to show you this because uh, those lines correspond to the complexity of the attacks in terms of the length of the message that you're building. And this is just to show that there are attacks for short messages that are different. So the red line here is the interchange, interchange structure, the one I explained to you. And those green lines are different attacks that also works with short messages. It was just to, to say that there are also other techniques. But uh, you'll have to read the papers to go through the details, and I don't actually remember right now. So let's just move on. So. Uh, I will now talk about Mac algorithms. So the first part was with hash functions. Now we're moving to Macs. So just as a reminder, this is the same picture as in the introduction. So we're looking at iterative Mac algorithms. So you have uh, some initial state that depend on the key, some state update function depending on the key, and some finalization function also depending on the key. And the size of the state will be L. The size of the output is N. And let's say the key, the key is uh, k bits long. But in most of what I'm going to say, you can assume that all those values are equal. It, I will not uh, go too much through, through the differences between them. So uh, the, the first important thing is that there is a generic attack that works against all iterated deterministic max, no matter how they're built. And it only depends on uh, the size of the state. So yeah, here it says n because I'm assuming n is equal to l. But in general, it would be l. And it's very simple. Uh, it's, it looks a lot like uh, the, the attack I explained earlier on hash functions, how if you have a collision, you can extend it and find more collisions. And in fact, for a Mac, you can do exactly the same. You can query uh, a number of short messages uh, of the same length, so say one block. And if you query about 2 to the n over 2 of them, you expect that there will be a collision. And in fact, uh, you can either have a collision in the internal state here or a collision in the output there. But in fact, with high probability, you will get a collision in the internal state. Well, you expect one of each. And if you take the collision uh, that actually collides in the internal state, you can extend it just like you extend it for a hash function. So here, we don't know exactly what are the states because everything depends on the key. But just, that inputting, but just by sending messages and looking at the output, we can do this same attack. We first identify a collision by looking at the output. And then we know that we can extend it. And in fact, when you extend it, you get a forgery attack. Because now you know that the Mac of n concatenated with c is equal to the Mac of n prime concatenated with c. So if you just query the Mac of n concatenated with c, you can use the same tag as a forgery for the message n prime concatenated with c. So you have only sent one of the pair to the oracle, and you can predict the Mac of the other one. So this is a forgery attack. And so if you look at it uh, in general, most Mac construction will have a security proof up to the birthday bound. And we have this generic attack with birthday complexity. So maybe we just know everything there is to know, right? Before the birthday bound, it's secure. After the birthday bound, it's broken. So why am I talking to you about this? Well, because it's not that easy. When you go after the birthday bound, you can still have different things happening. Uh, just like I've shown on hash functions, between 2 to the n over 2 and 2 to the n, there's still a variety of things that can happen, various security notions that can be broken or not. And it will be the same for, for Mac algorithms. So let me give you a few examples. So I will start with uh, Pmax. So this is actually not a Mac based on hash function. But I think it's an interesting example to see uh, how those uh, attacks on Mac algorithms can work. So PMAC uh, looks like this. It's a Mac that's designed to be parallelizable, and it's based on a block cipher. So you have a block cipher E. You use some secret value L. So L is computed as the encryption of 0 under your master key. And then what you do is you mask your inputs with multiples of L, and you compute uh, your encryption in parallel. You XOR everything, and you encrypt again. OK, so it's a very nice construction. You have a security proof up to the birthday bound. And there is uh, something slightly different. Depending on if your last block is full or not, you're going to do two slightly different constructions. So if the last block is full, you XOR it with L over 2. 
if it's not full, you pad it and you don't XOR any mask in it. So that's just how it's defined. And in fact, you can do a, a collision attack on this uh, by you building two sets of messages, A and B, and the set A is made of messages with a full block. So all of them, I will choose them to have the length of exactly one block, so 128 or N. And the messages B, I choose them to be shorter than one block, so that they will use this construction on the right. So when you compute the MAC of a message in this set, it will be the encryption of X plus L over 2. And on the set B, it will be the encryption of uh, Y padded to a full block. Okay, that's just how it's defined. And now, what happens if we try to find a collision between those two sets? So if we have two sets of size 2 to the N over 2, we know that we expect a collision in the output. And in fact, when will it collide? Well, it's easy to see because uh, E is a permutation. So they collide if and only if what's inside E is the same on the left side and on the right side. So we have a collision when X plus L over 2 is equal to pad of Y. Okay? And of course, the messages X and Y, uh, the attacker knows them because that's just the queries he made to the oracle. And so from this equation, we can easily deduce L. So we get the value L, and then we can compute all the masks in all calls to the oracle, and then we can do uh, forgery attacks easily from this. So this is uh, already, you can see it's a slightly stronger attack than the, the generic attack here. This generic attack, you cannot do forge for any message. You can only make forges for messages that start with M prime or M. But now in the case of PMAC, I have a forgery for any message because I recover L and then I can just do whatever I want. And what's interesting is if you do a slightly different version of PMAC, so I'm going to look at this construction here, it's something that's used in uh, AEZ. So AEZ is an authenticated encryption algorithm. And so it, it does a lot of things, but one part of AEZ is basically this variant of PMAC. And it's almost the same, except the, the way you compute the mask here is slightly different. So the multiples are not the same, but this doesn't really matter. And the value that you use, it's called J instead of L, and it's computed differently. And so what happens when we try to attack it? Well, we can do exactly the same attack with two sets of messages, one with full block, one with partial blocks. So we're going to recover the value of J. And now when we look at the specification, J is defined as encryption under a key fixed to zero of the master key of your scheme. And this is different from in PMAC. In PMAC, what you have is that the, the, master, the, the mask value L is computed as encryption under your master key of a fixed value zero. And why does it matter? Well, if you recover J, then you can recover the secret key because this function, encryption with a fixed key of zero, this is something you can compute and you can inverse because zero is a fixed value, E is the AES. So you can use AES decryption with a fixed key equal to zero and you get the master key K. And so this is quite interesting because the two schemes are very similar. If you look at security proofs, the security proofs are the same. But when you look at cryptanalysis, it's very different. In one case, you only get forgeries. And in the other case, you actually get the master key. So you have a key recovery attack with birthday complexity. But I think it's quite interesting, and it shows uh, why it's, impo it's, uh, it's, it's important to look at those attacks and not just to stop at we have a proof, then we have no proof. It's good to see what happens when the proof doesn't hold anymore. So those are just a few examples with block cipher max block cipher based uh, max and so like I said it's important to look at generic attacks and that's what we're going to do and we will do this on hash based max. So how do you build a Mac from a hash function? Well uh, I already explained briefly this morning but the idea is that if you have a good hash function it should behave like a random function like a random oracle and in particular it's very easy to build a Mac you can just somehow combine the key and the message as input on your hash function. And this should give you a good Mac if the hash function is good. And so there are two very simple ways to do it, called the secret prefix Mac, where you put the key before the message, and the secret suffix Mac, where you put the key after the message. So let's look at those two constructions. So the first one, the secret prefix Mac. So I already shown this slide uh, in the morning. And so you know that the secret prefix Mac is not good with plain Mekel-Dangard hash function, like MD5 or SHA-1, 
because there is no finalization function in those uh, hash functions. And this means that if you know the MAC of a message M, so it means you did this computation here, you start from the IV, you hash the key, you hash your message M, then you have the final block with the length that was hashed so far, and then this output is just what's given out as the MAC. And starting from this step, you can actually plug it in a different message and you can continue the computation. And you can put another block P and you can put uh, a finalization block with the length of what comes before. And then what happens is you can compute the hash of the key M for block two and P. And this is actually the MAC of the message M to P. And you have computed this without knowing the key. Just by knowing the MAC of one message, you can deduce the MAC of another message without using the key. And so this is a problem with uh, MD5 or SHA-1, and it's been fixed in more recent hash functions by just doing something different at the end. But so because of this, uh, this construction, the secret prefix MAC is not really used in practice because it was uh, having a problem with old hash functions. So the other construction is to put the key at the end. So this is another very natural construction. And there is also a small issue with this, uh, if you put your key at the end, you can do an offline attack against it. If you can compute a collision offline, so the attacker just takes the description of a function, say uh, SHA-512, he runs a collision search algorithm for SHA-512, so using polar draw, using uh, the parallel collision search. This is something you can do efficiently, well, somewhat efficiently, because of course if the size is big enough, this is not practical. But the important thing is that this is offline, and when the attacker has a collision, M1, M2, such that H of M1 equal H of M2, he can use this collision to make forgeries because when you query the MAC of F1 and the MAC of F2, they will be the same because the hash function is iterative. So if you are colliding after the two messages M1 and M2, if you put a key extra at the end, well, you don't know the key, but you know that uh, both computations will collide. And the fact that it's offline is important because doing say, 2 to the 64 operations offline, that's like borderline possible. But doing 2 to the 64 queries to an online oracle, that's, of course, much harder. So there is a big difference uh, between the two. And because of this, uh, this construction is not really used, because we don't like the idea that uh, the attacker can, can do this work offline instead of online. And in fact, this is also a real problem in practice if you use a bad hash function like uh, MD5. For MD5, it's very easy to compute collisions. And if you have a collision in MD5, then you can use it uh, to find forgeries for this MAC. And even for SHA-1, collisions are practical. It's hard to find it, but we know some collisions. So you can also break this construction for SHA-1. If you have some kind of key at the beginning, the, this whole line of work falls down because all the collisions that collision attacks on a hash function, I mean the, the shortcut attacks, they really use the fact that you know everything that's happening in the function, that there is no key in a hash function. And if you put a key somewhere, this breaks down. But here, the key is only at the end, so you can still use those techniques. Um, in fact, the, the secret suffix max is even worse than that. There's a, a, a more advanced attack that you can do. And so the, the idea here uh, you will try to do a key recovery attack on the secret suffix MAC. And again, it will be based on collisions. And the assumption is that you start by uh, finding a collision C0, C1. So you have two messages like this that collide. And you assume that the last byte of the collision is the same on both messages. And in practice, for MD5 or SHA-1, this is something you can do. So you can find a collision uh, with this property. And if you do it generically, of course, this is also something that you can do easily to just fix this value. And now what happens is if you send the green part of those messages to the oracle, so you remove the last byte of your collision, and you send the green part to the oracle, and what's happening when the oracle is uh, computing the MAC of those messages is that you have the green message coming in, and then the key comes afterwards, right? Because the construction is just taking the message, put the key afterwards, and take the, the hash of this. And in fact, if this byte here is the same as the byte in your collision that you computed before, then you will get a collision at this point when you process the hash function. 
And then the second part of the key is the same on both sides, so you will still have a collision, and you can detect it in the outputs. But if the first byte here of the key is not the same one as the, the byte in your collision, then most likely you do not get a collision, because now those two blocks, they're not the same as in your collision example. And so what happens here is that you can test a guess for one byte of the key with a complexity of just two queries. So you have to do two to the n over two work offline to find this collision. But then you just do two queries and you can test the value of the key. And then, so you will, try, you will do this for each possible guess of the key and then you can move, uh, uh, find uh, collisions that are slightly shorter and then you can guess the bytes one by one. And what's important here is that you play with the fact that the limits between the blocks uh, is not fixed and depending on the length of your message, the key can be split between two blocks. And you can have just a small part of the key that goes in a block together with a message and this allows you to, to test values of the guess. And so generically this attack has complexity 2 to the n over 2 but you get a key recovery attack so that's already quite interesting. And in fact if you have a bad hash function like MD5 then this attack can be done in practice. So 2 to the n over 2 is not very practical for MD5 but there is a shortcut attack to find collisions. And so you can use this shortcut attack and you can find collisions with this specific shape by fixing the last byte. And you can actually exploit this to recover a key. And in fact, this construction with MD5 is used in the APOC protocol, which is a protocol that's used to authenticate uh, to a mail server. So it's a, a real uh, protocol that exists in the wild and that you can break with uh, this simple attack and you actually recover the password. So I think that's a, a, a really interesting uh, result. So, um, so those are the two basic construction you can do. Either you put the key at the beginning or you put the key at the end. But like we've seen, both of them are not so great. So what are we going to do? Well, of course, we're going to put the key at both sides, right? That's uh, the next thing to do. So let's put the key at, bo at both sides. It's something that's called the envelope Mac. Uh, there's a security proof up to the birthday bound as always, but it turns out there's also a key recovery attack with complexity 2 to the n over 2, and the attack is actually exactly this one. Just when there is, so uh, you cannot use offline computation to find the collision, but you can use online queries to the oracle in order to find the collision, and again, you just need a collision with some specific value for the last byte, and then you can test a guess for the key. And again, this attack is based on the fact that the limit between m and k uh, doesn't have to be a block limit. So you can have a block that mixes M and K. So what else can we do? Uh, there's a variant of this construction called the sandwich Mac, which is essentially the same, but now what you do is you pad the key and you pad the message before constructing your message. So the definition of a Mac is you take the key, you pad to a full block, you take your message, you pad to an inter integral number of blocks, you concatenate everything, you put the key again, and you hash this, right? So it's very similar to the envelope Mac. You also have security up to the birthday bound. But now this key, this key recovery attack, you cannot apply it anymore because uh, this limit here between the message and the key, it will always be a block limit. You cannot mix them inside a block. So you're going to, so this will stop this attack. And so again, you are in this situation where you have two constructions that look very similar, that have essentially the same security proof, but one of them has a key recovery attack and the other doesn't. So as long as you are below 2 to the n over 2, they are the same, but if you go just slightly above, one of them completely falls down and the other is still mostly okay. I mean, you will do forgeries, but not uh, key recoveries. Is it clear so far? Okay, good. So uh, let's keep going. So. In general, uh, Mac constructions based on hash function will, lo will look somewhat like this. You will somehow put the key at the beginning and somehow at the end. And one popular way to do it is HMAC. I will not go through the details. It doesn't really matter for us. Uh, but what's important is that you have some initial value that depend on the key and the finalization function depend on the key. But in between, you just have this compression function that comes from your hash function. So this is maybe the compression function of SHA-1 or the compression function of SHA-2. So it's a public function. So you're applying a public function in the middle, but the starting point is secret, and what's happening at the end is secret. 
And this is the, the type of construction we're going to look at. And uh, from now on, we're going to make the assumption that L is equal to N is equal to K. So everything is just N, and this is the security level, and this is the state size, and this is the max size. And it will be much easier to talk like this. Of course, most of the attacks can be generalized with different parameters, but it's easier to explain them in this uh, special case. OK, so uh, again, we're going to look at generic attacks. And the main question is what happens after the birthday bounce? What kind of attack do you get? Do you only get uh, existential forgery, or do you get uh, something stronger? So I'll go through different types of attack. Uh, first, some state recovery attacks, then some universal forgeries, and then uh, a key recovery attack in different uh, scenarios. So some bibliography. Uh, what I'm going to talk about will be based on mostly those uh, three papers. And uh, so let's start with a relatively simple attack that was proposed in 2013. And so the idea is uh, to start from a, a simple case. We're going to use a fixed message block. So say this block here, we fix it to uh, zero. And we want to see how that can help us. Okay, so it's the same kind of ideas that we did on the, the attacks on the, the XOR combiner with the very long messages with lots of zero blocks. So here we just use one block at the moment. But then when we fix this block to zero, then this function here becomes a fixed function from n bit to n bit. Because, well, the, the function is known. It's the compression function of SHA2. And the message is known. It's zero. But of course, we don't know the input of this function because it depends on the key. And we cannot observe the output be before, because uh, before giving us the state, we go through another function that depends on the key. So what can we do with this? Are there some properties of uh, this fixed function that we can use. So the idea from 2013 is to use, to try to detect a bias in this function, because we have a fixed public function from n bit to n bit. And we know that this type of function, well, it's not a permutation. So some values will be hit more, uh, more often than others. Well, first of all, some value have zero pre-images. Lots of values have one pre-images. Some have two, three, four, five. And some values are more likely to be found than others. And this will be the, the idea behind this attack. <clears throat> and so what can we do? Uh, what we can do is evaluate these fixed functions many, many, many times with random inputs and just observe the output and try to detect an output that is more likely than others. And in fact, if we do almost 2 to the n uh, evaluation of a function, we can find the most likely output, and we know that it will appear around n times. So it's slightly more likely than random. I mean, a random value will be, uh, uh, will be reached only one time, and if you select a good one, it can be reached around n times. So now, so now we know that if we start with random blocks, and then we put this fixed zero block, this value here, x3, it's slightly more likely to be equal to uh, this value x star, right? There's a small bias that x3 is more often equal to x star than to something else. So how can we detect when this is the case? Because of course, we don't see this value here. So what we're going to do is uh, something we call a, a filter. This will be a way to test the internal value during the computation. And the goal is to see what's happening when you compute your Mac with some message M. And we have some internal value here. And we have a hypothesis. We say maybe this value is equal to x. And is there an efficient way to test when this is the case or not? Because of course, this value is not given to us. So we have to do something a little bit uh, smarter. And what we can do is uh, smart start from this value x and try to find a pair of messages c, c prime that give a collision from this specific value x. And this requires about 2 to the n over 2 evaluations of the compression function. So here the function is public. x is some value that, uh, that I know and that is a hypothesis. And so I'm building this. And now I'm going to use c and c prime in order to test this value here. And so this is something you do offline. Just the attacker does the computation himself from the description of the compression function. And now we are going to use it online by making queries to the Oracle. 
So we're going to send two queries to the Oracle, M concatenated with C and M concatenated with C prime, and we will observe whether the, the output is the same or not. And what we know is if by chance this state here was the candidate X, then of course we have a collision. And we have a collision here, and then we have this finalization function G that depends on the key. We don't know the key, but we know that if there's a collision before, there's also a collision after. So we can detect this. And so this is just the idea of the filter. You just, first you find a collision offline, and then online you make, you make those two specific queries, and this will tell you whether the state here was equal to X or not. And then we can use this uh, for an attack on this type of, uh, of hash-based Mac algorithm. So first you're going to fix some message block to a specific value zero. Then you find a value uh, here that is more likely than random. And then you're going to make, uh, no, sorry, then, then you do the, uh, okay, so this is all offline. So finding a value that is more likely is just evaluating the function offline. Then you find a collision offline starting from this specific value. And then you will start sending queries to the Oracle. And you will send queries of the form some random block, zero, and then the value C and C prime that comes from your filter. And you repeat this for many random choices of M0, and if you detect a collision, then it means that the state here was equal to X star. Uh, yes, that the state, sorry, the state here, X2, is equal to X star. And so this gives you an attack because uh, this succeeds with probability about n times 2 to the minus n, so it's slightly more than you would expect randomly. So it's, it's a very borderline attack. You're only gaining a logarithmic factor, but it's a little bit more efficient than it should be in general, and you are recovering the state uh, during the internal computation. So this attack is quite simple, uh, but it's, it's nice because it allows us to see the general structure of these types of attack, and the idea is that we will first identify special states, special values of the internal state that we know how to recognize and that we know how to reach. So they must be uh, easier to reach. So here it was just that the, the compression function more often gives some specific value. So it, it's more likely to reach this value than another one. And then we can build a filter to detect those states. And then we send queries to the Oracle and we can test whether we, we did reach this specific value or not. And so we will now see uh, a class of various attacks that use this general framework, but that will be uh, a lot more efficient than this first attack. So uh, first, we can do a nice attack based on cycles. So this will be uh, somewhat similar to the attacks on the XOR combiner. So what we do again is uh, we've, we use a fixed message block. So we fix the message uh, value to zero, and we will use long messages with lots of zeros in them. So a very long message with only blocks of zeros. So what's happening when we do that? Well, we're basically iterating this fixed function. So a function h with a message set to zero. That's a, fix, that's a fixed public function. But now we are iterating it. We don't know the starting point of the computation. We don't know the ending point because this depends on the key. But we know that we are iterating a public function. And so again, we need to find interesting properties of this public function that can be used in this setting. And for this, we're going to use at the cycle structure of random mappings. And again, this will be similar to the attacks on the XOR combiner. And so what can we say about random mappings? Well, uh, you've already seen this slide this morning. So we know that when we look at uh, what's happening when we iterate the function, we have a structure that looks like this with cycles, with trees that are connected to the cycles, and with uh, several cycles. And we know that we have those, uh, those results about the expected uh, length of various parameters. I will uh, explain a little bit where those results come from. But first, how can we use this? And one property that can actually be used efficiently is the length of the cycle. 
So let's assume that we know the length of a cycle, and it's actually easy to find the length of a cycle because the function is public, so you can just evaluate it yourself until you find the cycle, and then you just measure the length. And then what you can do is build two specific messages. So one message will have 2 to the n over 2 blocks of 0, and the other message will have 2 to the n over 2 blocks of 0 plus l blocks of 0, where l is the length of the cycle. And the idea is that if you are slightly lucky, when you look at what's happening with the first message, you start from some point that you don't know, but with some probability, when you do 2 to the n over 2 blocks, this will be sufficient to reach a point in the cycle. And then when you look at the second message, so you start with 2 to the n over 2 blocks of 0, so again, you reach the cycle, and then you have L more blocks, exactly L. And when you do exactly L blocks of 0, you just do exactly one round of the cycle. And so those two messages, when you do the computation, you will end up exactly in the same state. And therefore, this is something you can detect because you will have a collision. So when you actually compute the MAC, you have a finalization function, so you don't see those values here. But if you have a collision, they will still collide through the collision function, and you can detect it. Yes? Very good question. <laughs> So, absolutely, there are several cycles. So in general, we don't know which cycle we're going to reach. But uh, what's happening is that there is one specific cycle that comes with a very large component. So with high probability, we, ha we are in one specific cycle. And I will actually explain a little bit why this is. <clears throat> so let's try to explain uh, how do we get those results. So there are several uh, interesting results here. So when you look at uh, a random mapping like this, in general, you expect that the number of components is logarithmic in the size of the domain. The number of cyclic nodes is about square root of n, and they are in, uh, in different cycles. The tail length is about square root of n, so the tail length means how long it takes from a random point to reach a cycle. The cycle length starting from a random point is about square root of n. And, it's, and what's very interesting is that you have a large tree and a large component that actually make a constant fraction of the full space. But I will try to explain why this is, because this will be an important property to explain uh, some of the attacks. So let's assume we have a random function. f from a set x to itself with the size of x being capital N, being also 2 to the N. And we're going to compute iterations. So we start from some random point. We compute iteratively the function f. And we know that at some point, we're going to reach the cycle. And so if we start from a random point, We can try to, uh, to estimate the expectation of how long it takes to reach a cycle. And in fact, it just comes from the birthday paradox. If you iterate this about square root of n times, you know that you will get a collision. So just some uh, notations first. OK, here it is. So I'm going to denote this part here as the tail length uh, lambda. This here is the cycle length mu. And then you have the rho length rho, which is equal to lambda plus mu. And so rho is the length of this thing before it collides. And so you know that starting from a random point, the expectation of rho is about square root of n. Okay, I will not care too much about the constant factors, so uh, the constant factors are given in the slide, but they're quite hard to, to get a real proof of the constants, so I will just do a, an asymptotic analysis without the constants. 
So you know that you expect the row length to be around square root of n because that's how long it takes before you get a collision. And in fact, when you have a collision, most likely the point where you cycle back will not be at the very end of your chain and will not be at the very beginning of the chain, right? It will be somewhere around the middle. And so because of this, um, so with high probability, the cycle entry is far from the edge. And because of this, you get that the expected value of lambda is also theta or square root of n, and the expected value of uh, mu, the cycle length, is also around square root of n. <clears throat> okay, so this is relatively simple. So this is when you just do one uh, chain and you see how long it takes to reach a cycle. And now what I'm uh, pretending is that if you start this specific chain, well, as you can see on the slide, there is a large tree and a large component in the random graph. So it means that with high probability, the cycle that you find here is the main cycle. You are in the main component. And actually, this tail here will also be part of the largest tree. And so you can see it uh, relatively easily. So uh, assume that we are given a fixed chain starting from x0. So this here is x0. But now we're going to build a second chain. And we're going to see that in many cases, we will reach the same cycle. So assume given a fixed chain and start the second chain. from a random point x. <clears throat> and what happens, so let's do the new chain in blue. So you're starting a new chain here from some new point. So you're starting to, so you're iterating this, iterating, iterating. And in fact, two different things can happen. Either this new chain can cycle on itself and this will happen after roughly square root of n iterations, right? Or this new chain can somehow connect to the previous one. And in fact, this also happens after roughly square root of n steps. Because here you have square root of n different points. And as long as one of the new points is the same as the old one, you will reach the previous chain. So in fact, you have about the same probability of finding a new cycle or finding the old cycle. And so this shows that with constant probability, you are in the same cycle as the first one. And so you will have a giant cycle as, uh, as claimed here. So, so with constant probability, The chain from x joins the chain from x0 before cycling. And that's the important thing. And because of this, you have a giant component. And in fact, uh, it's also stronger than that. With constant probability, you reach this chain, but also with constant probability, you reach it before the cycle. You reach the tail part of this chain because the tail part has about square root of n nodes. So about half in the tail and half in the cycle. So the probability is a bit slower, but it's still a constant probability to reach the tail part. And this is why you have a giant tree. So with constant probability, you join the old chain before cycling, and with constant probability also, 
you're going to join the tail of a chain from x0. And because of this, you have a giant tree. <coughs> OK. Uh, where did I put a clicker thing? Here. OK, so this analysis is relatively simple. It doesn't give you the exact constants, but it shows you that you do have a large tree of size, a constant fraction of the space, and you do have a large component of size, a constant fraction of the space. And this is why you can compute offline the length of one cycle, and with high probability, when you do your online queries, you will go to the same cycle. Yeah? But that's also funny, right? Because that means that you do like polar growth to find the collision. With a constant probability, you will get like the same hash Absolutely, yes, yes. When you do polar row, you always get the same collision. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's quite surprising. And this will actually be used in the next attack I'm going to show. <laughs> so it's a very good remark. And yeah, it's something quite surprising. When I first uh, found out this, I, I, I was uh, rather surprised. Yeah, it's some, not something you expect. Absolutely. But it's just a property of a random mapping. Uh, OK, so let's go back to, to our to our attack. So we're building those two messages with just blocks of 0. First, you do 2 to the n over 2. Then you do 2 to the n over 2 plus l. And with high probability, you end up in the same point. Uh, OK. And then what is the probability that this works? Well, you need the starting point to be in the main component. And the probability is about 0 0.76. You need to be uh, not too far from the cycle because you only, you're only using 2 to the n over 2 blocks. Sometimes it's not enough. But with probability about 1 half, this is true. And so you just have to repeat a few times, and uh, you will get uh, this, uh, this thing happening. So there's just a small thing. I'm actually cheating a little bit. Uh, it's the same problem as this morning, that those two messages here don't have the same length. And when you look at typical hash functions, they use the message length at the end. And so this is going to break your collision. Even though you do have the same state here, when you actually compute the MAC from this state, you will have something depending on the message length. And so you will not observe the collision. So we need to do something more in order to, to really get an attack. So yes, the problem is that you have the length somewhere. So this morning, what we did was using expandable messages. And that was really nice for hash functions, because in a hash function, there's no key. So you control everything, and you can build your expandable message. Here, in a Mac, it's much harder, because you don't know the starting point. So building this kind of expandable messages would be uh, rather annoying. So instead, we're going to use a different trick. We're going to go to the cycle twice. So we're going to build a message that looks like this. We will have 2 to the n over 2 blocks of 0. So hopefully, this will get us to the cycle. Then we do a message that's not 0. So we stop moving around in the graph. We do something different. So we end up in some random point somewhere. And then we put, again, 2 to the n over 2 blocks of 0. And with some probability, this will be sufficient to reach, again, the cycle. So that's just an R at the beginning here. That's just because we want to be able to repeat this a few times. So we just randomize the starting point with some non-zero block. And if we have a message like this, what we can do is we can create two, var two variants of this message where we put L more blocks of zero either in the first part or in the second part. And then what happens is the first message, what it does is it goes to the cycle, do one cycle around, then move to something different, then goes to the second cycle. And the other message, it goes to the cycle, do something different, goes to the cycle, and turn around. And in fact, those two messages end up at the same position because this yellow thing here, where you do something different, you're doing it from exactly the same position because the state here is equal to the state here because the difference is just one turn of a cycle. I mean, assuming you reached the correct cycle, of course. But then assuming you're in the right cycle, then those L blocks, they do nothing. So the, the, the yellow thing is the same. Then this is all the same. 
And then this cycle here also keeps you in the same position. So with this simple trick, by just going twice to the cycle, we have solved the problem of the length of the messages because now those two messages, they have the same length, but they still, but they are different, and they both do one turn on the cycle, but at different time. Yeah? How do you know what the capital L is? Oh, so this capital L, that's the length of the cycle, and we pre-compute it because the function that we iterate is public. It's just, let me go back here, so it's just this compression function H with a fixed message block. So this function, we know it, and so we can evaluate it ourselves and look for the cycle. Just due to, to the another two operations, we find the cycle and we measure the length. But yeah, we need to know it. So there's a pre-computation phase where we extract this value. And so this is basically the attack. And uh, it's quite simple. You just have first an offline phase where you find the length of the cycle. Then you have an online phase. You just build those two very specific messages where you will repeat a few times with different values of R, but let's just assume it works the first time. So you just have two very specific messages. And you know that with high probability, they have the same Mac. So you can use it uh, to make forgeries or uh, to make something else. And the complexity is about 2 to the n over 2, uh, both in the offline phase to find the cycle length, and also in the online phase, where you only make two queries, but they're queries with very long messages. So the complexity, well, very long, uh, of length around 2 to the n over 2. So the complexity is essentially 2 to the n over 2. And if you compute the success probability, it's about 0 0.14. So it's also not, uh, not very small, right? Good enough. And so what can you do with this attack? So uh, as I said, you can do it as a forgery. You know in advance that, that those two messages have the same Mac. Then you can also append random blocks, of course. But it's not very interesting because we already know how to do forgeries with complexity 2 to the n over 2. But it's stronger than that because this is an attack that only applies to one particular hash function. So you can think of it as a distinguisher between uh, HMAC with uh, SHA-1 and HMAC with uh, RIPEMD160. So you take two different hash functions. And when you do this attack, uh, the offline step depends on the actual hash function you're using. And so this collision will only happen if you have a very specific hash function inside, inside your construction. And so it's something that intuitively should be hard to do, to recognize the hash function inside your Mac. But because of this attack, you can actually do it with uh, birthday complexity. So this is the first thing you can do with this attack. And actually, you can also do more than that. You can do a state recovery attack, uh, a little bit like the, the first attack I've been talking about. And this will actually use uh, exactly the, the question you were asking earlier. The fact that with high probability, when we enter the cycle, we enter one very specific point. Because there is a giant tree, and with high probability, the starting point is in this giant tree, so we enter the cycle at one very specific point. And we can detect this point offline, because the function is public. Uh, yeah, just what I wanted to show. There is a large tree. So with high probability, we enter one specific point. And so we can do an offline computation to find out exactly the value of this point here. And then in an online phase, we can use a binary search to find the smallest length here, such that we enter the cycle. By making queries with a varying length here in the first part, we can find the smallest length so that we reach the cycle. And then we know that at this very specific point of the computation, with high probability, we have exactly this value of the state. And this is really nice because uh, a state recovery attack is something that intuitively should be much harder than this, but the complexity is actually just uh, 2 to the n over 2, so just birthday complexity. So uh, that was the first attack. Do you have questions so far? OK, good. So uh, now we will move to a different flavor of attacks to try to do the same thing, a state recovery attack. But now I will not use cycles. I will use just uh, chains. So this will be a bit similar to what we did this morning with uh, the XOR combiners. We had two flavors of attack, one using cycles and another uh, without cycles. So why do we care about attacks without uh, cycles? When one motivation is that this attack I've just, I've just explained uses very long messages with about 2 to the n over 2 blocks. 
And in fact, some hash functions, if you read the specification, they don't allow you to have so, such very long messages. So those attacks are technically not valid. So that's one motivation. Uh, and the second motivation is that those attacks are not applicable to Haifa hash functions. So if your compression function is different at each step, then you cannot use cycles because, of course, you're not iterating a single fixed function. So there is no cycle. So this old approach just doesn't work at all. So we will try to find a, a different type of attack. And in fact, a, a nice parallel uh, you can make is with the different algorithms we have to find collisions. So there are two important algorithms to find collisions that I've described this morning. The first one is Pollard row, which is based on cycle. And the other one is the parallel algorithm from von Orschott and Wiener. And this one uses chains that are too short to cycle. And so uh, just to give you a kind of a parallel, the first attack I've just given you was similar to Pollard row. And now we try to find attacks that are more similar to von Orschott and Wiener. So uh, what are we trying to do? We will uh, try to use a fixed message, so with some fixed blocks, and we're going to have a relatively length, long message with fixed blocks, and then what happens when you compute the MAC of such a message? Well, you're just evaluating a sequence of public functions. So all the compression function, so we're now looking at Haifa construction, so maybe the compression function is different, but in any case, we will use a different message, so it doesn't really matter, but we have public function at each step, but they are different. So we iterate the sequence of fixed functions. So what can we do with this? Uh, again, we don't know the starting point. We don't know the ending point. So we need to find some kind of properties that could be exploitable in an attack. So it cannot be cycles because there are no cycles. But instead, what we can do is uh, look at the entropy loss. The idea being that uh, when you apply a fixed function from n bit to n bit, you know that the image set is about is it 63% of the size or well, something like this. 1 minus 1 over e, I guess, or something like that. But anyway, you, you shrink your, your space because some values don't have any pre-image. And when you iterate the sequence of functions, at each step, you're shrinking the state a little bit more. And so you have a smaller and smaller set of values that can be reached when you go very deep with very long uh, chains of function. And this is what we're going to use. So uh, how does it work? So. Uh, this is just a reminder of uh, the, the parallel collision search algorithm by von Orschott and Wiener. And the idea is you start many different, you, you take many different starting points, you iterate chains, and you know that with some probability your chains uh, will collide. And then you detect it in the output. So actually it's not exactly von Orschott and Wiener because here I'm iterating different functions at each step. But the idea is the same, you iterate and with some probability you find collision. And what happens is, uh, the, the, the image set, if you iterate 2 to the s different function, a sequence of 2 to the s function, the size of the output set is about 2 to the n minus s. And the reason for this oops. So it's basically the pictures that's here. So you are doing iteration, so it's not the same function anymore. So you have f0, f1, f2, and so on. And you're going to do many different chains. The length of a chain is 2 to the s. And what I claim is that when you do 2 to the n minus s different chains, so you're going to have 2 to the n minus s uh, ending points. And so when you do this, you don't expect too many collisions because the total number of points that you have here is about 2 to the n. But when you do one more, then there's a high probability that it will collide with one of them. And so the, the sweet spot is around 2 to the n minus s. And this is why uh, the size of the image set is about 2 to the n minus s. So this is just a way to measure this, uh, this entropy loss to know uh, how far we have to go. So now what can we do with this? So the basic idea is that we're going to do uh, something online. We're going to do some queries to the Oracle with the fixed message n. So we know, well, we want to randomize the starting point and then have a fixed sequence of blocks. And then we know that the ending points uh, will be 
in this set here of size 2 to the n minus s. And so this is online by making queries. And we do the same thing offline by just choosing ourselves some random values and evaluating the function ourselves because the functions are public. And then we can find values here that are also in this set. And if we have enough values at some point, there will be a match, right? So the problem is, well, how many values do we need to build? And how can we test whether they are equal or not? Because of course, we don't see those values here at the end of the chain. Because again, there's a key at the end that's going to, to mess with everything. So um, of course, what we're going to do is to use uh, filters, like in uh, the first attack. So how can we do that? Uh, let's do a first attempt. So we're going to build an online structure with lots of queries, with some random block, and then a fixed sequence. The offline structure, uh, we're going to choose the parameters so that s plus t plus u is equal to n. And this is just because of uh, this information here, that the, the, the size of the set here is about 2 to the n minus s. So if we have t plus u is equal to n minus s, there's a good probability that we have a collision because of the birthday paradox, one more time. Uh, da, da, da. Yeah, so we're going to make all those queries, and then we need some way to test whether there is a match. And so the easiest way will be to use, again, uh, collision filters, like uh, previously. So when we, uh, when we do the offline structure, we know exactly, we know a set of values in this set that are uh, likely to be reached. So we can build collision starting from each of those points. And then in the online part, we will uh, make queries with those two blocks pp prime, and we will detect whether this value was equal to x or not. OK, same idea as earlier. Now, uh, what is the complexity if you try to do this? So again, we need to have s plus t plus u is equal to n. Um, and the problem is when we want to, to test the values. So first we do the offline part. We find points here, then we build collisions filter, and then we do online queries. So we're going to do queries i, c, p, and i, c, p prime for many different values p, p prime. And these queries, so each query is of length 2 to the s. We make 2 to the u queries, different queries. And for each of them, we have to test with all of the candidates in the offline part. So we actually need 2 to the t times 2 to the u queries, each of them of length 2 to the s. So the complexity is 2 to the s plus t plus u, and that's actually 2 to the n. So this is not an attack. So this doesn't work. So we need to do something different. And one way to, to, to change this attack is to swap the offline part and the online part. And we're now going to build filters, so trying to find collisions to detect a specific point, we're going to do this online. So this, of course, is a lot more expensive, because now we have to take uh, the fixed message n of length 2 to the s. We have to try many different values of p, about 2 to the n over 2 of them, until we find a collision. So the complexity to build a filter is about 2 to the n over 2 plus s. So this is very expensive, and we cannot do this too often. But we can do it a few times if s is not too big. So it's possible. And then the good thing is to use this filter. It will be done in the offline phase. So it essentially doesn't cost anything because we just have a candidate value and we just compute the compression function twice and we know whether the, the values are equal or not. And when we swap things around like this, the attack actually works a lot better. So we're going uh, to start with the online phase. We query lots of messages with some random block i, then the fixed message c. And then we build filters. So we need to try many values for one more block after this. And so this costs 2 to the s plus u plus n over 2. So this is relatively big. So you have to be careful with the parameters. But then we do the offline part. You can use a much larger value of t. And you can do many times computing this long chain. You find a candidate at the end. And then you test with all the blocks pp prime coming from the online phase, and you can test whether there is any equality between those values or not. And the complexity will be 2 to the t plus s to compute all those chains, and then t plus u to try all the tests for uh, matching a value 
here and the value there. And when you try to balance the parameters, you find out that, uh, that if you choose u equal to s, you get something that works. You have an attack with complexity 2 to the n minus s, as long as s is uh, smaller than n over 6. And so this means the, the optimal parameters is with, of course, s is n over 6, and so you have complexity 2 to the 5 n over 6. So it's, of course, not as efficient as the simple attack based on cycles. But the good thing is this works for the HIFA construction. And we are using much shorter messages because the length of the message is 2 to the s, so that's about 2 to the n over 6. So we now have a variant with short messages that works for HIFA. We can actually uh, improve it. I guess I will not go through too much details. At what time am I supposed to stop? Sorry? 30 minutes, okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so maybe I can explain just a little bit. So we're going to use this uh, diamond structure that I briefly explained uh, yesterday. Sorry, not yesterday, this morning. And the way these structures work is that you, you start from a set of candidate value and you try to find messages that make them collide two by two. And so you're basically reducing the, the size of your set and then with several layers, you end up with uh, a single point. And the complexity to do this is not so high because what you do is you, you start so you start with your uh, set S and from each point you try many different random blocks so this is S and then you see if there are collisions between all those values here and as soon as you have a collision, maybe uh, this one is equal to that one, then you can fix this message R0, this message R1. So in general, they are different, but this is fine. And you know that if you take those values, R0, R1, you end up with the same state here. But maybe you have a collision between this one and that one. And maybe the other, you don't find a collision, but that's fine. You can keep them as they are and just select some random block. And here you have reduced the size. Initially, I had one, two, three, four, five, six values. And now it's been reduced to four. And so what is the complexity of doing this? Sorry, I'm missing the slides. Uh, so, oh, OK, n is not a very good choice of notation. So I will say I'm starting from s values here. And then for each of those values, you're going to try 2 to the n over 2 divided by square root of s different blocks r. And then with high probability, well, you get on average about s collisions when you do this because the number of collision, uh, you have to count the number of pairs that you can build from this. And the number of pairs is about s. So we have s points here. Each one has two to the n over two over square root of s different uh, blocks going out of it, and you're going to square this. So this is the number of pairs times two to the minus n, because each pair collide with probability two to the minus n, and so this number of collision is about s. So this means you start from s value, you have about s collisions, so most of the points will be involved in a collision. And so you can reduce the size uh, significantly. So I will not go through the details. Sometimes you have one value in two different collisions. So you just drop one of them. But as long as you can reduce the size by a constant factor, you know that after a logarithmic number of steps, you will end up with a single value. And so that's what we do here. And the total complexity is uh, this here. So why is it helpful to do this? Because we can now uh, build our filters more efficiently. Because in this attack here, the expensive part was to build all those filters here. Because what I explained uh, first is that you, you choose a random value i, you fix your c, and then you have to try many values here until you find a collision. Because that's how you will detect you will have a filter for this fixed value here. 
And now we're going to build all the filters simultaneously instead of building the filters one by one for each candidate. And to do this, we use this diamond structure because now we're going, uh, so we're going to, to do something like this. We make all our queries like this and then we try random blocks until we have collisions between them. So we will have this type of collisions happening and we do this by making queries to the Oracle. So it's not an offline process, it's an online process, but we can still do it because the only thing we need uh, in order to build this structure is to detect collisions. And collisions, we can detect them even though we don't know what's happening at the end. So you can build this structure and then you can build a filter only for uh, the root of this tree and then you have something a lot more efficient. And in fact, the cost of building the filters uh, is now 2 to the s plus u over 2 plus n over 2, and earlier it was s plus u plus n over 2. So you have reduced the, the cost of u, and because of this you can rebalance the parameters, and you get something that can goes down to uh, 2 to the 4 n over 5. So it's slightly better by using uh, a more advanced technique. Okay, uh, you can also improve a little bit if you uh, go back to merkle damgard so if you assume that the compression function is always the same, but what you can do is uh, look at, uh, again, if you look at collision finding algorithms, you look at the, the collisions that can be detected and actually the collisions are also somehow special points that are more likely to be reached than others. So this is similar to what happens with cycle finding. The entry of the cycle is a point that's easier to find and that is reached more often than a random one. And when you do something based on uh, the, the collision finding with uh, von Orschott and Wiener, you also have a similar effect that the collision that you find are not random, they are uh, specific values that are more likely to be reached. And so you can use this to also build a variant of the attack that can have uh, a slightly lower complexity, but then it doesn't work anymore if the uh, compression function are different at each step. And so if you look at the various trade-offs that you have, you get graphs that looks like this. So for the high fan mode, uh, you have attacks until 2 to the 4n over 5, which would be a value here. And depending on the length of the messages that you use, the complexity goes down a little bit. And if you are in merkle damgar mode, you can go down a little bit lower. And there are other types of attack that gives you better results for longer messages. And in fact, uh, this point here is the cycle attack because you have messages of length 2 to the n over 2 and complexity 2 to the n over 2, so that's the first attack. And this line here is basically the same attack but using slightly shorter messages. And in fact, if you're lucky, you still reach the cycle and this gives you uh, this part of the graph. And in the middle, it's a, a different attack that I will not have time to go through. And I think this is quite interesting. When you look at those graphs, I mean, this, these graphs look, look, look really weird. So uh, it feels like something is missing, right? So, so maybe there's a better attack uh, to be found somewhere in this area. Okay, so this is the end for state recovery attacks. Do you have questions? Or was it relatively clear? Okay, good. So uh, I will briefly talk about universal forgery attacks, but this really gets quite technical, so I don't think I will have time to go through the details. Again, you can look at the papers if you want more details. Uh, but the idea in a universal forgery attack, the, the goal is that, well, as an attacker, uh, you receive a message C, a challenge, and you have to predict the MAC of this challenge without asking it to the Oracle, of course. So you're given an Oracle that can compute the MAC of anything, and you have to use this to predict the MAC of the challenge. And we're going to assume that the challenge is relatively long. And uh, the idea is you're going to look at what happens when you evaluate the MAC of this challenge and you have many intermediate states. And you, you will try, the, the basic idea is actually the same thing as the, the second pre-image attack on merkle Dangard with long messages. In a hash function, you don't have a key, so it's much easier. You know all the values in the middle. And you can just try to reach one of the values in the middle, and then you have your second pre-image attack. So here we want to do essentially the same thing, but because of the key, it's much harder to, to detect when you actually reach one of those values. But the, the core idea is, uh, is the same. We try to reach one of those values, 
And then if we reach one of those values, we will query the MAC of the message that goes M prime and then the end here. We query this and we know that it will also be the MAC of uh, the challenge. And that's how we get a universal forgery. But of course, it's a lot more tricky to do it. So I will start with some uh, simple cases. Instead of looking at the general case with a key at the beginning and a key at the end, we can try to see how it works if you have a key only on one side. So let's assume there's a key only at the end. So if there's no key at the beginning, then everything here is known to the attacker. And so in fact, we can just use exactly the, the second pre-image attack on Merkel Damgard. So yeah, just uh, one remark, all those uh, universal forgery attacks, they will not work on Haifa. So in this part, I'm assuming the compression function is fixed, is the same for every block. So if there's no key at the beginning, I can just use the second pre-image on Merkel Damgard. I build my expandable message, I reach some point in the middle, I select the right message, and then I know that those two messages collide, and so I can use it to uh, compute my forgery. So this one is relatively easy. And the complexity will be essentially 2 to the n minus s, where s is the length of the challenge. So if a, if a challenge is short, you don't have a big advantage, but if the challenge is quite long, uh, it can be interesting. So a second degenerate case, let's assume we have a key at the beginning, but not at the end. So the finalization function is completely known. What can we do with this? So it's not at, as easy because now uh, when we look at the computation on the challenge, well, we cannot do anything because we don't know where to start from. But what we can do is take this long message C and then try to truncate it. So I'm going to take just the first block of C and I'm going to ask for this mask. And then what happens is the, or the, the Mac Oracle, it will start from this secret value. It will do the first block of C and then the finalization function and it will give me this value here. And then I do the same with two blocks, I get this value, with three blocks, I get this value, and so on and so on. And so I don't get the actual values during the computation, but I get G of those values. And G is a public function. I'm in the special case where there is no key in G. And therefore what I can do is compute myself G on many different random values. And if I do it with a big enough set, there will be a collision between the blue dots here and the blue dots there. And I can detect the collision because uh, when you go through G, you will also get a collision. And so what you do, you will send many queries with truncated versions of C. Then you do an offline computation with uh, 2 to the n minus S states. And when you have a match, what happens is you just recover the value of one specific point in the middle of the computation. And then you can compute yourself everything until the end because there is no key involved. And so this is a simple attack in this case. And the complexity is 2 to the n minus s plus 2 to the 2s. So here it's 2 to the 2s because each query has length close to 2 to the s and you're making 2 to the s queries. And so, uh, okay, so now we have an attack if there is no key at the beginning and we have an attack if there is no key at the end. Those are the two easy cases. Now, if you want to do the hard case, I will not go through all the details, but uh, the basic idea is similar. We, we need to recover somehow the value of one of those intermediate states. And to do this, we need to find some information about them. So we will have to use uh, different tricks. But one particular idea that we can use is to compute the distance from those values until we reach a cycle when we iterate a fixed block. And so this is the first trick. What we do is uh, we fix a message block value, uh, for instance, zero. And then we're going to make queries like this where we start with a prefix of the challenge and then we do a very long chain of zeros. And then we can use a cycle-based attack. We know that when we have long chains of zero, we can go to the cycle twice and detect collisions. And then what we can actually do is measure how long is this part before we reach the cycle. And this gives us a little bit of information about this value here. And then we can do some offline computation that will also measure the distance of many different points. And then we can try 
to match them. So I will not go through more details, but it's possible, and with some parameters, it will work. Uh, just going to skip this, and you can also do a version without cycles by just using long chains. Again, similar to the two types of attack we have uh, in each case. And just a summary with the complexity, but well, the, the actual numbers are probably not that important. Uh, but if you can use long queries, there is an attack with complexity uh, 2 to the 3n over 4. So it's, it's actually not bad. It's not 2 to the n over 2, but it's not too far. It's halfway between 2 to the n over 2 and 2 to the n. And you get universal forgeries. And if you limit the length to something shorter, then it's a little bit more expensive. But you also have attacks uh, that are better than 2 to the n. OK, so this is about uh, universal forgeries attack. Now let's move to the final, well, the, the, the golden uh, attack. Can we do key recovery attacks on those type of computations? So key recovery, of course, is much harder. It will not be possible in general, but it's possible in some very specific functions. So I'm going to look at the ghost family of hash functions. This is the family of uh, Russian standards. There are two of them. An old one uh, with a size of 256 bit, and the more recent one with a size of 512 bits. And the more recent one uses the hi fi mode, and the old one uses the, the Merkle Damgan mode. And the only thing you need to know for this talk about these functions is that they use a checksum. So that's this thing here at the top. When you look at the finalization function, it takes an extra input, which is just the XOR sum of all the message blocks. So it's just the way the function is defined. And the, the intuition is that, basically, it adds more complexity to the design. If you're trying to make an attack, you also need to control this extra checksum here. So hopefully, this will give you more security. Of course, if, you're, if I'm saying this, it means it's not giving more security, right? Uh, and in fact, something very interesting happens when you take a function like this with a checksum and you use it in HMAC. So HMAC is one of the ways to build a, hash uh, a MAC out of a hash function. I didn't explain the details so far, but you don't need to know everything. The only important thing is that the key will be used as part of a message. Because the goal is just to use the hash function as a black box. And so the hash function has only one input. That's the message. So of course, the key is going to go inside the message. And this is interesting because now when you look at the finalization function, it's going to take as input the checksum. And the checksum is something that depends on the key and also depends on stuff that the attacker can control. And you can maybe put differences in there. And you can do something a little bit like related key attacks on the last block here. And so let's see how that works. So we're trying to do a key recovery attack on this construction. So the first step will be to recover the internal state of some message, some short message. So let's assume I know the state x1 after some value m0. Then I'm going to build a multi-collision, so a large set of messages that all go to the same uh, value x star. Now I can focus on what's happening at the end. So I know that I can have many different values m with the same value x star. And I can evaluate this thing with many different m's and uh, this x star here. And of course, I'm going to look for collisions because that's the only thing we know how to use. Because uh, if you go back to the full picture, after this computation here, you go again through finalization. So the only thing you can detect is collisions. But well, you have your set of messages. And if it's big enough, you evaluate. Uh, this function for all your messages, and at some point you will have collisions. And you're going to keep a list of collisions. You need about 2 to the L over 2 collisions. And for each collision, you remember the value of m and the difference between the two messages that you've been using. Because this difference is actually the difference that goes inside this uh, special input for g. So this is something you do online. You do lots, lots of queries in order to get all those collisions. And then you're going to do an offline part where you compute the function g yourself using the value x star that you know because you did a state recovery attack. And you're going to use random values here because you don't know the key. But using random values, you will also get collisions. And if you have a large set of collision, 
eventually you will get two collisions where the difference between the inputs is the same. So you have two collisions with the same difference between the values. And when this happens, actually with very high probability, it means that you have exactly the same inputs. Because we're talking about a function with n-bit input and n-bit output. So if you fix the difference, you expect that there is only one given collision with this fixed difference. And in fact, when you do this, all those steps require less than 2 to the n over 2 operations. And in the end, you know that n plus n prime equal x plus y prime. Uh, you know, no, sorry. You know that k plus m is equal to y. m is known, y is known, so of course you recover k. So you, you really have a key recovery attack uh, based on this. And this is really a, a surprising result that the, the fact that this ghost function has this internal checksum, it actually makes the hash function weaker, at least when you use it in HMAC. Because you now have a key recovery attack and the complexity is about 2 to the 3 L over 4 for the old ghost because uh, there's a special trick that we can use to recover the state of a very short message. For the more recent ghost, we cannot use the special trick, so the complexity is a bit higher. But in both cases, we have attacks with complexity uh, smaller than 2 to the n. Uh, I don't think we care about this, so uh, I will just conclude. So um, I think this, uh, in this talk, I've tried to give you a taste of some surprising results you can have with generic attacks. And those are results I really like. Uh, they're really something you don't expect. So in the first part, we've seen that when you XOR two different hash functions, you get something that is weaker in terms of pre-image security. But intuitively, you would expect to get something higher. And then with Ghost, you see that the use of a checksum also makes the full thing weaker. And I think those are really surprising results that you don't expect and that, that are really, there's really something funny happening. And so more generally, uh, the, the message is that when you look at different constructions with very similar security proof, it doesn't mean they have the same security. When you go outside of the proof, things can be di very different even though the, the construction are the same. And because of this, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to look at generic attacks to better understand the security. And uh, maybe as a nice opening, uh, you can see sometimes there's still a gap between proofs and attacks. And uh, also if you remember the graph of the complexity, they look very funny. So probably something is also missing. So I guess it's possible to do some more work in this area and to try to, to improve a little bit those results. And uh, I will leave it with that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for the lecture. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so one on a bit lower level. Uh, so in the final uh, key recovery uh, state, uh, so yeah, the first step, uh, so when recovering the internal state for a short message, do you yeah. use the techniques from the other state recovery module that you showed using filters? So do you use filters to recover the state of a short message? Uh, so, so essentially my question is how do you recover the state for the short message? Oh, okay, okay. Uh -huh. So uh, there are some very specific tricks in this attack, so I will not go through the tricks, but the basic idea is that you use, uh, you use, you use attacks, uh, like, so you don't use the attacks, so you need, a, no, sorry, this is universal forgery, that's not what we're talking about. So we're talking about state recovery, so, um, so depending on the function, one of them is merkel Damgard, the other is Haifa. But in both cases, you can see that if you want short messages, it's still possible to find an attack with complexity below 2 to the n. As long as you have messages of length somewhat exponential in n, even if you want only 2 to the n over 50, you will still be below 2 to the n. So you just have to find the right trade-off. But generically, you can, uh, you can do it. And in fact, in the, the old goes, there's a special trick that you can use. When you get the state of one message, you can get the state of another message that is shorter. But that's a bit outside the, 
what I explained today. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, so basically I was trying to understand the applicability of the state recovery here. Because for universal forgery, you didn't, I, if I'm not wrong, you didn't use state recovery techniques, but mostly collisions. Uh, because uh, in this model state recovery, it felt like you're trying to find the internal states for special messages, which have a bunch of zeros in it. So I was trying to find how does it help us in, I don't know, trying to um, attack something, coming up with a more devastating attack. But it seems that you use this to recover key in. Uh, so in, in the, the key recovery attack, it's really because of the checksum that we can do anything. It's really because there is this checksum that will become key dependent. And so once we recover states, we know everything that's happening except for the key, and then we can use special attacks based on the key. In the case of universal forgery, it's really a different set of techniques that yeah. we have to use. Exactly, yeah. Um, because for universal forgery, you, you're given like a target arbitrary message and you're supposed to forge it. Exactly. But in state recovery, you're sub you compute the internal state for specific structure messages. Exactly, we choose the yeah. message that we send. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And my final question is, uh, in your conclusion slide, when you come up with the, there's like a mismatch between proofs and attacks. Yeah. So, but isn't the reason is because those proofs, you really capture a specific security property for example, I don't know, for Max, you have CMS security or so, but may, do not comment upon universal forgeries or key yeah, recovery, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It depends on what notion you're looking. If you're looking just as uh, existential forgery, then there is no gap between the proof and the attack. But for some other notions, there is a gap because we don't have a better proof when we move to a harder notion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> Nobody else, I think? No more questions? Everybody's too tired.